NASA claims that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter proved that the US flags were all still standing at all but one of the six alleged Apollo landing sites. In my previous video, I showed that this claim was impossible, and therefore the LRO pictures were doctored, because the flag would have been destroyed by radiation and micrometeoroids decades ago. The Soviets erected their own flag outside the Mir station in 1991, and after 408 days, it was reduced to only two threads. It seems that I touched a nerve with my previous video, because it sent many propagandists into a desperate panic attack. It even started a whole series of DMCA attacks on my channel. Some accused me of being deliberately deceptive because I supposedly only discussed the effects of micrometeoroids on the flag. This is false. I specifically discussed the effects of micrometeoroids and radiation hitting the flag. Some nitpicked on my not discussing the effects of ozone residue on the flag, which was mentioned in one of my references. Honestly, I didn't think there was any need to discuss the effects of ozone, because even in our atmosphere, ozone is not that abundant. The highest quantities of ozone you'll get is in the ozone layer, some 20 to 30 kilometers above sea level. There, you will only find 10 parts per million of ozone. Everywhere else in the atmosphere, the average concentration of ozone is about 0.6 parts per million, or 0.00006%. To put that into perspective, at sea level, the atmospheric density is about 2 by 10 to the 19 particles per cubic centimetre. This means that at 0.6 parts per million, there are only 12 trillion ozone molecules per cubic centimetre. 12 trillion may sound like a lot, but that is insignificant next to the 15.6 quintillion nitrogen molecules and 4 quintillion oxygen molecules that make up the vast majority of our atmosphere. Or put another way, Mount Everest is 8,848 meters tall. 0.00006% of that height would be a measly 5 millimeters. But I'm afraid it gets even worse than that, because this 12 trillion number applies to sea level. Atmospheric density decreases with altitude. Near 600 kilometers above the Earth, this density drops all the way down to 20 million particles per cubic centimeter. This would yield an ozone density of 12 molecules per cubic centimetre. And to be blunt, that is being more than generous to the pro-NASA side, because I'm using the average concentration of ozone in our atmosphere, not the actual values. This reference places the ozone concentration in our atmosphere between 0.001 and 0.125 parts per million. This is somewhat less than 0.6 parts per million. But being generous, I'll stick with the 0.6 number for now. The Mir station orbited the Earth at around 370 kilometers above sea level. At around 300 kilometers, the density of the atmospheric gases is between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 9 particles per cubic centimeter. Taking the sum of these densities gives us 1.01 billion particles per cubic centimeter for 300 kilometers. Of course, the density will be even less at 370 kilometers. But I'll be generous and use this 1.01 billion number. Applying that 0.6 parts per million to this density, we find that there are only 606 ozone molecules per cubic centimetre. Out of curiosity, I took an average of the ozone densities at 300 kilometres and 600 kilometres, and got 309 molecules per cubic centimetre. So for 370 kilometres, we can expect an ozone density somewhere between 300 and 600 molecules per cubic centimetre. Assuming the higher end of this range, that means there is 20 billion times as much ozone on the ground than where Mir orbited. Actually, all of this is of course being rather generous, because I was using the average ozone quantity in our atmosphere. Realistically, since we're talking about residue, we should expect something less than 0.001 parts per million at these altitudes. Being a tad more realistic, this 0.001 ppm value gives us 1.01 ozone molecules per cubic centimetre at 300 kilometres and 0.02 molecules per cubic centimetre at 600 kilometres. And an average of those two is 0.515 particles per cubic centimetre. That's less than 23 trillionths of the ozone quantities at the ground. This low density is important. Propagandists claim that the ozone at Mir's orbit would have been enough to significantly deteriorate a flag in two years. Well, if that was the case, then the far higher levels of ozone down here should be destroying flags at ground level. And for that matter, most of our clothing in far less time. Perhaps they'll say it's because the ozone hit the flag at a high speed. 
Well, I can't find any reason why ozone molecules hitting at high speed should chemically react more often, or more strongly, but let's consider that possibility. In an atmosphere, the average speed of a gas molecule will be determined by its temperature and molar mass. Without getting into details, for ozone moving at room temperature, this works out to be 321 meters per second. Now the Mir orbited the Earth at 7.7 .7 kilometers per second, so ozone orbiting in the opposite direction will collide with a speed of 15.4 kilometers per second. That's a ratio of 48, meaning... what? That an ozone reaction will be 48 times more likely? Even if so, ozone would still be 416 billion times more damaging at ground level than at the Mir station. And yet, our flags are all still standing down here. But let's ignore that for a moment. Returning back to our realistic 0.001 parts per million ozone value for space, we learned that the average of the quantities is 0.515 molecules per cubic centimetre. Therefore, realistically, the ozone density at 370 kilometres should be somewhere between 1.01 and 0.5 molecules per cubic centimetre. Meanwhile, the average density of solar wind alone is about 6 ions per cubic centimetre. That's 12 times the average ozone quantities. If you were a flag erected outside a space station, I think ozone residue would be the least of your worries. But hang on, you say, no fair, because ozone is heavier than solar wind and would do more damage. At the risk of having to make another video to deal with that claim, let's get it out the way here. Ozone has a molar mass of 48. Solar wind consists mostly of hydrogen ions, which are protons with a mass of 1 gram per mole. This tells us that the solar wind's impact will be a quarter of the ozone's. But before you get excited, we should also consider the impact speeds. The solar wind ranges in speed from 300 to 600 kilometers per second. Being generous, I'll take the lower number of 300. Dividing that by Mir's speed gives us a ratio of 19.5. Except that, to compare drag forces, we don't take the ratio of the velocities, but the square of them. So the impact of solar wind will be 95 times greater than ozone. That makes ozone pretty insignificant, wouldn't you say? When their ozone argument didn't work, Propaganda cited an Astronautics.com article that contains the following passing mention. They also removed the remnants of the Soviet flag, placed on the mast during its assembly in 1991. It had been reduced to shreds by UV degradation and orbital debris, and meteoroid impacts. Orbital debris refers to shrapnel from other satellites in Earth orbit. With a significant increase in satellites over the past four decades, there has obviously been a major increase in the amount of orbital debris floating around in the low Earth orbit vicinity. Due to the relative sheer lack of missions around the Moon, there is no threat of orbital debris there. Needless to say, propagandists are now clinging to the lack of orbital debris on the Moon as proof that the flags could have survived for decades. To see if there is any grounding to that claim, we simply need to take the danger of orbital debris out of the equation and recalculate the rates. In my previous video, I cited data from the lunar orbiter probes and the Earth orbit satellites Explorers 16 and 23. All seven of these vehicles carried micrometeoroid detector packages with a collection surface area of 0.186 square meters. You can see from this table that the lunar orbiters received 22 punctures at a rate of 0.16 punctures per square meter per day. Explorer 23 sustained the most damage with 50 punctures over a rate of 0.36 punctures per square meter per day. If we divide the number of impacts by the rate multiplied by the collection area, we find that it took 747 days to sustain these 50 impacts. Of course, this was back in the 1960s, when there was virtually no orbital debris. We need to correlate this with the hazard of the 1990s. I learned that between March 25, 1996 and October 1, 1997, the Mir station carried an instrument called the Orbital Debris Collector. I do stress that this data is from a few years after the Mir flag was destroyed, and so the rate of punctures here were probably slightly higher than those of 1991. But as you will see, I am again being more than generous to the pro-NASA side. It carried two detectors, each with a surface area of 0.35 square meters. Of the two, tray 1 contained the most punctures, 212. Of course, this tray is much larger than that carried aboard Explorer 23, 
So to find the hit rate, we first need to adjust for area. We divide the number of punctures by the number of days multiplied by the surface area, and we get 1.09 punctures per square meter per day. Comparing this to the 0.16 numbers from Lunar Orbiter, we get 6.82. That means it would take 6.8 times longer to destroy a flag on the moon, or 2,774 days, which is about 8 years. This is far longer than my original two-year estimate, but inconsequential to my overall conclusion. Taking orbital debris out of the equation means that those flags would have been destroyed by 1980. It's difficult to imagine them surviving well into the year 2012 and then be photographed by LRO. But hey, I was being generous, wasn't I?